Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the blessings of this day and this first day of the week that we have assembled ourselves together. We want to praise your name first of all yes. and bow before our God yes. before we ask you anything else. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on us. Amen. We now intercede today for these requests in this room, these who are bereaved, these who are not doing well, and we pray for Rosemary that you just heal her body. And we pray, God, today for Alta's mama and for him and for all the others that's called out, Craig Short, Don Greyhouse, everyone that's been called out. And now, Father, we, we just place the prayer list of this church before your throne this morning to intercede for these people. And we thank you right now in this classroom that you're hearing our prayers and your answers will come. Bless this church today. We just pray one request. Let thy will be done. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's please turn today to James, the second chapter. A living faith in the life of the church. Our first part is partiality. I put on the board a little sketch that came to me at 5 o'clock yesterday morning. Well, they stick me in. But I put one here about us and God. We see in verse one more about this. Then over here on the other side, I put between two individuals. And the verse one says, have not the faith of God we have over here of Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons. These two are contrasts. Don't, don't have this faith toward God and then have between ourselves Respect the persons, that's partiality. Let's go ahead and read verse one. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, and with respect to persons. Don't, don't, don't let that be your life. Don't talk about your faith that you have in Jesus Christ, Lord of glory, and then at the same time, have respect to persons. That's not the match that God would have us to have. Can one be saved and have that? Sure. We have a lot, we have a lot of that going on among saved people. But God is simply saying, this is not the way I want you to live your life. Matter of fact, the Bible says, how can we say we love God whom we have not seen if we don't love our brother whom we have seen? So our faith toward God is not something just parallel. It should also be between us as individuals. When it comes to very Serious thing is having all respect of persons. We have five things on the first part today. Number one, we'll see now a practical situation that God gives us to back up verse one. Let's go ahead and read this practical situation in verse two. Four, if they come into your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man and vile, the word may smell in our dirty raiment or clothing. And you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing. Gay means clean, experienced, impressive. <laughs> and say unto him, Set thou here in a good place. And say to the poor, Stand thou there or sit here under my footstool. Are you then, are you not then partial, where it may made a difference in yourselves and become judges? It means with evil reasoning of evil thoughts. So now when God gives us verse one through James about this diagram here, he now gives an example about trying to have faith and then have respect to persons. When one comes to church, walked in the church doors, he got on a gold ring and impressive clothing. And we say to him, you know, come down front. We recognize you. We'll give you a good seat. Then someone comes in with a foul, smelling, and dirty clothes, a poor person, and we say, well, you can sit over here on this footstool. Mm -hmm. And that's God's- That's Joe at the Christmas play. Uh-huh, it is, mm -hmm. it is. That's, that's, that's a good illustration. Mm -hmm. yeah. So God is saying now, I want to illustrate to you what verse one means. Don't tell me you got faith in me and you have in your assembly partiality to people's appearance 
or their, their financial status, who they might be or not even known. That's not the way I want you to do when you come into your assembly. And this is a problem across our country among many churches. If we're not careful, we'll show partiality to somebody and it's moved in town. You get somebody some time moved in Thomas, so any small town, sometimes the paper recognizes it. It'd be in the paper. That so-and-so is moved into town and they got the status, financial status and all this thing. And somebody moves in the backside of nowhere, they're not even mentioned. And that must not creep into the church. We know it's in the world today, in the workplace, in schoolhouses, all of that. We know all that's going on today in the world. But God said it should not be in your assembly when it comes to the assembly. Now, let's go ahead and come back for a discussion on this. Look at the uh, many poor people who are heirs of God's kingdom. Uh, verse 5. Hearken or listen, my beloved brethren. Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which hath, hath he promised to them that love him? So he said here, the poor people many times are the ones who get saved. Keep in mind the Bible says it's easy for a camel to go through the eye of a needle and for a rich man in the kingdom of heaven. The more, there's more poor people saved or lower class people saved than the, those who are prosperous. Because many times those who are prosperous see no need in the cross. They see no need in the blood. They got everything going well. And sometimes until they hit rock bottom, even then sometimes they're not saved. But sometimes rock bottom brings them to realization they need something besides what they got as far as mammon. But he says here again in verse 5, it's the poor people who have been saved, who have become heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to them that love him, that's those people. Because, so back up here now, it could be that poor man coming into the assembly that I can save today. That poor person who has great many needs, that's the one today I might can save. And the one comes in all decked out, may not have even a desire to be saved. So keep in mind this in your assembly. Look at our fourth part. Rich people were oppressing and dragging Christians to the court and we're slandering the name of God. Verse 7. Let's go down to verse number 7. No, I missed verse 6, didn't I? Go back to verse 6. That part is the poor were being dishonored publicly. Verse 6. But you have despised the poor. Do not rich oppress, or the word means use one's power against you. Isn't it rich people to try to use their power against you and draw you before the judgment seat? Not the poor people. But you despise the very ones that would treat you more kindly than those that are rich who oppress you. That's, right. That's the ones that give you a hard time. That's the ones that put their nose down at you. But the ones that are poor that you have many times respect for in a different way you do those that are prosperous. That's the very group that's going to love you and support you is the poor I have saved by my grace. Now back in uh, the fourth part. Look at verse 7. It says this, do not blaspheme, do, do not, they, they blaspheme the rich people that worship, that, do not, they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called. Many times he says the rich will do that. It's not saying all rich people are lost and going to hell. We, we have examples of people that's rich who got saved on fire for God today. But I think the, uh, the, the, the numbers are a lot different as far as the uh, statistics of those who are saved mm -hmm. and those who are poor and rich. There's a big, big difference there. Now, look at the next part we have here. And the fifth thing is the real king is Jesus and the royal law is, 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 is his law. Let's read verse 8 and 9. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, here it is, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. Mm -hmm. Now, who is our neighbor? It's not the one next door. It's anybody. But you have respect for persons you commit sin. Now, God says it's sin. If someone comes to your assembly with a gold ring and you say, sit in, my, you sit in the good place and somebody else is poor, sit on my footstool, he said, what you've done, you committed sin. And you and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Then verse number, then verse number, uh, that's it. Now, I have in your paper, partiality and love of neighbor are incompatible. They will not go together. Now, on the first part today on partiality, you want to have some discussion, questions, and comments about the first part? So, Brother Dean, 
when we talk about respect of persons, um, that, that means that we're supposed to love everybody, you know. We may not necessarily always like them, but we're supposed to love them as our neighbor. So what is the difference in respect of persons and unequally yoked? You talking about not, not being yoked with them? Right. Those that's lost? Right. Well, I think partiality is always wrong. Mm -hmm. It don't matter who it is. Mm -hmm. You don't have to well, be yoked, yoked with them. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you don't have to have partiality. partiality. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I don't. I think right here, he, he didn't say here. Here comes one saved. Here comes one lost. He described, he described their appearance. Mm -hmm. So I think I can, you can have respect for anybody, mm -hmm. without having to be yoked with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't have fellowship with them, but you have respect for them. You don't show them. You don't look down on them because of their status. Mm -hmm. But you don't be yoked with them. Right. You know, you can be nice to those that's not nice to you. Mm -hmm. Even these rich, prosperous people will give us time of day. We don't have to, we can still represent Christ having the faith of God and then still not showing them partiality. Mm -hmm. I'm going I'm to love you like I would the one that loves me. Right. Like somebody comes to my church, pats me on the back, mm -hmm. I'm going to love you like I love them, but I'm, I won't be yoked with you. Right. I think that might be the answer. Yeah. Anybody else got any more thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. There's as much of a situation with people that are, are the, the vile, as the Bible described it, to hold resentment or opposition toward those that are appearing more, you know, maybe wealthy or more in a better condition. Um, I ran into that with some uh, family, new family that I had met, and uh, a position was taken against the appearance of being uppity, was their wording, and just point blank asked. You know, was I that way? Was I feeling like I was better than them? So it doesn't come necessarily from one side. It comes from both, a resistance. I know when I was a little boy, James Beecham with his name, he came to our country church, and James drank beer all the time. He was a painter, and he always, he always had beer on his breath, and James come to church. He's lost. He has on his white paint, he wore them all the time, paint clothes, and you can smell beer on him. I, I remember. I remember what happened that night. I was just a little boy, but some of the men wanted to ask him to leave. My daddy stood up against that group of men and said, "No, you can't ask that man to leave church. Mm -hmm. He's not bothering nobody." Mm -hmm. That man got saved, and God called him to preach. Oh, oh, my he died as a preacher. Mm -hmm. Now, what would have happened that night if those people say, "You can't, you can't stay here. Mm -hmm. You got beer in your breath." He might never got saved before. Mm -hmm. yep. See, unless they unruly trying to cause trouble, you know. What, what the Bible said, go out and get the heart, the mind, and the blind, and the maim, and bring them on in. My house be filled, you know, as long as they're not causing trouble. I think we all forget that our our righteousness is as filthy rags. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. and, and the girl that gave us a hard time last year in Thomaston, you know, Deacon and I talked about it, and everybody, we talked about it, I could, and she was talking about she was coming. I said, if she comes, we're going to love that girl. Mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to be hypocritical. I was going to try to love that girl. Mm -hmm. She needs the Lord. Joanne. I feel sorry for her. Mm -hmm. She's in Canada now, but she still hates us. Yes, what's, a, what's a bad life to live, isn't it? Yes, yeah. it is. But she needs, she needs, she needs God. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't just say, "Well, I'm gonna call the deputy to you if you come down here." No, no, we have to love that girl mm -hmm. because you know that again is what he's saying right here. If I'm gonna have faith in God, I can't have respect the person that comes to her either, mm -hmm. or anybody else that would come against us. In, in other our words, world. we're not supposed to pick and choose our friends. We're supposed to love everybody. Love your neighbor as yourself. The second part is the judgment of the law. We have four things. Number one, many would accept that partiality is a sin, but that it's, it's a little one. You know, it's not all that bad now. Mm -hmm. Verse 10, this is what God said. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point mm -hmm. is guilty of all. He's still in the same context here so far about this respect, respect of persons. So say we had 100 laws and we keep 99 of them and we break one. Yep. You see, you're guilty of all. Yeah. So nobody can boast about keeping the law. Amen. So he says again, but we must not 
we must not minimize this thing about respect the person, like saying it's just a little thing, you know. In other areas, we are strong in. It's just a little thing. But I think it's a serious thing. If, if, it was, if, if it was us that walked into a place and we didn't have the status we have this morning, how we might be treated. I went to a revival years ago in one of Robins and the evangelist was dressed real nice with a nice suit. He began to preach about something on this same line. At the while, he pulled off his uh, coat. There was holes in it and his tie had been cut off and he pulled off some more. Uh, at the while, he pulled off his shoes, had socks in his he had holes in his socks. Before he got through, he was a ragged mess up there. He said, now, are y'all changing your concept of me now? Mm -hmm. I was dressed real nice a while ago. Mm -hmm. Y'all see me in a different way now? I, I, it was a strong point. Yeah. Yeah. He, was a, he was a mess on that, on that pulpit. <laughs> but he brought out an illustration from a nice dress suit preacher to somebody in rags. <laughs> and uh, I still think about it, you know. When you saw the illustration. Now look at this for a moment, please. Uh, when a believer breaks one of God's commandments, he has not just rejected some law, but has rejected his authority. Verse 11, for he has for he that said, do not commit adultery. And you and I can say, well, I have never done that. I don't do that. He said, okay, now. Said also, do not, do not kill. Well, I haven't killed anybody. Now, if thou commit no adultery, if thou... And yet, if I kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. You can take any other two laws you want to take in the Word of God and say, well, I don't do that, and I do this over here. So you're still guilty or transgressor of the law. doesn't matter which one you're guilty of or which one you're innocent of. Again, if one of these laws I'm given is broken, then you're guilty of all of them. So again, it's not the list. We can't keep the list that's why the Bible teaches us that the uh, that grace is what we have today. Grace. The law could give life to no man, right. but the grace of God can. Now, the third, the third thing here, everyone will be judged by the law of liberty, verse 12. So <clears throat> speak ye and so do, as they that judge that shall be judged by the law of liberty. That's the law we be judged by, by his authority, be judged by the law of liberty. Then number four, mercy conquers the judgment that everyone deserves and rejoices in triumph over it. Verse 13, for he shall have judgment without mercy. Now this is talking about applied by the Lord as chastisement. He will have judgment without mercy that, that have showed no mercy. And mercy rejoiceth against judgment, or mercy glorifieth against judgment. So verse 13 again is talking about, is talking about mercy conquers the judgment that everyone deserves and rejoices in triumph over it. Mercy does that, not justice. Mercy does that, that God has mercy upon us. So now the second part, do we have a discussion or comments about the second part? If not, look at the third one. Faith and works. We have three things to look at. We're going to have an argument, objection, and evidence that God gives to break these three things down. Number one, the first argument. The question that's asked is in verse 14. What doth the prophet, my brethren, though a man say, look at the word say now, he says he hath faith and have not works. Can faith save him? That, can that kind of faith save him? Can that kind of faith save him? That's the question. Someone, I'll tell you what, uh, Brother David, right quick, turn to 1 John 2, 4. Can that kind of faith save him? If a man, a woman says, I've got faith, and that faith is not proven by works, did that faith that man said he had save him? You get it, Brother David? Mm -hmm. Listen to what we have here. 1 John 2, 4. Uh -huh. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So we're going to see now through these next three things here, these illustrations, again about saving faith is proven by works or keeping God's commandments. 
Somebody says, but I'm a Christian. You had all the time, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. But their life doesn't support that statement, mm -hmm. doesn't back up that statement. So the faith they say they had, did that faith save them? That's the question being asked. So now I look at the illustration we have. I'm going to clear this thing up. This is the illustration. If, since you say you have faith and have not works, here we go. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you should say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth the profit? So we see here an illustration. You know, be warm and filled. I'll be praying for you. And they need food and they're naked. Mm -hmm. He says, now, what's missing is works. You see, you got faith. But the illustration is you let people just leave your presence without any attempt to help them. Now, what profit is that? If we tell somebody today oh, who needs food, or needs clothes, and we say to them, well, y'all be warm now, it's going to be cold tonight, and y'all y'all go out and take care of yourselves, and we'll be praying for you. He says, now, what doth that profit? Mm -hmm. If you don't put clothes on that person's back and some food in that person's presence, even though sometimes we are scammed, we know that. But that's out of the picture right now. He said, right now, the fact you say you've got, you see, again, respect the person's. When it comes to somebody that you can actually illustrate that you have experienced saving faith. Now, the conclusion in verse number 17, it says this, even so faith, we're talking about even so faith now, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. So, what's some of the first works you can think of that would show up quickly when somebody gets saved, has saving faith? What's some of the works that first show up? You think in a, in, a, in a baby in Christ's life. Now, the, the works will increase as he goes, uh, gets older. She gets older in Christ. What's, what, what's some of the first things that show up? They go to church. That shows up, don't it? If they're physically able. They get baptized. Mm -hmm. They want to get baptized. They begin to ask about, when can you baptize me? That shows up. Mm -hmm. And you see them, really, you see them, maybe not right then, but you see them the next few weeks, the next few months, a different person, don't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They begin to hug next and they just get, you know, you see, you see things <laughs> begin to show up. They have a heart change. The heart the, change. It's salvation. salvation. But then it begins to show up in that person's yes. life. Mm -hmm. They want to tell others they got saved. Yeah. They'll be reading the Bible more, trying to find out more about his word. Yeah. So certain things begin to show up in that babe's life that he or she had saving faith. Right. And as he gets more warm and mature, see, what, that's what Paul said to Corinthian church. He said, you're still babes in Christ. Mm -hmm. I can't bring you to me because you're still, on, you're still on, on, on milk. You're still babes in Christ. And that church was very troubled, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. a, flesh, a fleshly church. Anything else you can think about that's short right quick? One gets truly saved? When they start having a prayer life and they have a fellowship with God. And I think conviction, when a person begins... If he cusses again, some words slip out, mm -hmm. he'll have conviction about it. Immediately. Immediately. Mm -hmm. Love shows up too. Love shows love up. Shows love. Because God is love. Yes. So if God is in there, what shows up? Love does. Mm -hmm. Now, look at the next one. The objection here, a question. Can saving faith be shown without works? That's a good question. Verse 18 says, Yea, a man may say, look at the word saying that. He says, Thou hast faith, you got faith, I got works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Mm -hmm. Somebody says, Well, uh, thou hast faith, and I have works. We're different. God said, No, no, no. If you got faith, show me thy faith without thy works. Show it to me. And I will show thee my faith by my words. Show me your faith without your word. And he can't prove that he can't, he can't, he can't do that. Show me your faith without your words. It's impossible. But you can show me your faith. I can show you my faith by my words. See, we won't be judged, we won't be judged at judgment of the Christ for sin. 
but for works. Mm -hmm. See, that's the difference. Mm -hmm. Even a lot of people judge for works. Mm -hmm. The sin question is not in any judgment. It's the works. The works. So, if we get before the Lord one day, He's going to judge me and you for our works, not the sin. The sin has been taken care of. The sin and unbelief in Christ is taken care of. It doesn't mention anything about sin, but it does say we must give an account of everything we've done in our body, whether good or bad. We must give account of that. Now, look at here in the illustration. Even the demons believe what good is that kind of faith. They believe too. Verse 19 Thou believest that there is one God. You're going to brag about that? Thou doest well, but the devils also believe and tremble. And they go one step further than most, most people. They tremble. Mm -hmm. And people say sometimes, well, I believe in God. I believe in the word of God. I believe all of it. But it doesn't mean he's saved. It doesn't mean he's saved. I used before somebody, I say, if you're on a, if you're on a self starvation diet, and I ask, what's your favorite meal? Give me your favorite meal. And they'll tell me, well, whatever. And I said, okay, you, you're starving to death. I bring that meal to you and put it on a platter before you right now in your seat and you still won't eat it, you're going to starve to death. Mm -hmm. Now you believe it's going to, if you eat that meal, you believe it's going to help you, but you won't eat it. See? And I place before you today the gospel <clears throat> that gives you life and you won't take it in. And you believe it like you would that plate of food. But unless you take it in, you're still going to be lost. That's right. So he says the same thing right here about the same thing. It's just, it's not just believing, it's receiving and confessing. The very ones that recognized Christ on the earth first were demons before anybody else did. Before Peter did in Matthew, demons first of all recognized, hey, you're Christ. They recognized him. So, faith that works, verse 20, but will thou know, O vain, empty, empty man, that faith and that works is dead? It's the same thing. Your so-called faith that you got is dead because you don't have works to back it up or prove it. The last one now is the evidence. Illustration, Abraham sacrificed Isaac, justified him. He did, verse 21. <laughs> Was not Abraham my father justified? Justified means here to show one to be righteous or confirmed. Wasn't he made righteous by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? That's the question. And the answer is yes. He was justified. See, the Bible said it was, he was imputed, or the word means credited to him, righteousness. 400 years before the law came. He was, he was saved and credited to him righteousness 400 years before God sent the law through Moses. The law had nothing to do with it. But he see what he'd done, he done what God said here in verse 21, and by doing what God said, he said he was justified. He was considered righteous because the words backed up what he said he believed. He told his son that. He said the Lord provide a lamb. He knew that in his own heart. So look, look at the conclusion in our last part. Faith was made perfect by works. Verse 22, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works? And by works was made, faith was made perfect or complete by his works, offering up his son Isaac. By that work, faith was made complete, Abraham's life. Then now on the bottom of the page, the next illustration is this. Abraham's works fulfilled the promise of faith. Verse 23, And the scripture was fulfilled, which said, Abraham believed God. Here it is. It was imputed or credited to him, to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see, God on his own credited to Abraham righteousness. Again, without the law, without the cross, without the blood sacrifice. He justified him. Because Abraham, at that time, obeyed God. And today, we are referred to ourselves. He is referred to as the father of the faithful. And we're called to see to Abraham. And, we're, and we, we have to us credited righteousness. Listen now. Not because we carry somebody to the mountain. Because somebody else went to the mountain for us. And that was Jesus. So Abraham went to the mountain 
the same Mount Moriah that the temple's on today. The, the temple we were built today, same location. But we didn't, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't have to carry somebody up there. Our Jesus went by himself to the mountain. And because of what he done, see, and we receive him and confess him, then it's credited to us righteousness, as it was to Abraham in the Old Testament. And we shall sit down, the Bible said one day, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Sure. See, all those three that God saved in the Old Testament. Now, which verse I read last? 23rd. Okay, verse 24. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only? See, James and Paul didn't argue about this. Both, both of them were right. Even though Paul wrote from the Holy Spirit, for by grace are you saved through faith. That's true. It's not saying these two men saw it different. They are both inspired by the same Spirit. They actually said the same thing. They said the same thing. James just said here to back up the faith by grace through faith are you saved, to back it up and make sure that everybody knows you're saved and you know you're saved too. You want to have works to back it up. You have works to back it up. And it's not the works now that the church may assign you. It's not those works. They're spiritual works. It's not just a list of things I do in the church. It can, re can verify I've done all these works. I must be saved. I can do a whole wall full of works, still not be saved. It's the works that God recognizes. A drink of cold water in his name, you receive a prophet's reward. And we don't recognize somebody in the nursery giving a cup of cold water, do we? But God does, you see. It's, it's the works. What a matter of fact, Paul said it this way, it's the works that shall not be burned. Because the works that shall be burned is wood, hay, and stubble. And the works that shall not be burned is, is considered gold, silver, and precious stones. And the works I think that stand the test we get before God is the works we have done in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. If I've done it in Clark's Chapel's name or the Baptist's name mm -hmm. or my own self's name, they're going to burn up. Right. It has to be done in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And those works will stand. Now look at here another example. Rahab, protection of the spies justified her. Two spies came in to her and, and she and she done this. Now, let's read verse 25. Likewise, not just Abraham now, not just Abraham, but likewise also was not Rahab, the harlot, justified, a saint, again, that showed, showed to be righteous by works, when she had received the messengers and had sent them away, out another way, was she not justified? Now, let's notice what, oh, but they be pretty fast, do it again, Dave. Joshua 2.11. Why he's finding that Rahab's protection of the spies justified her. Let's notice now what Rahab said. Very important. We're just to hear now. Joshua 2 11. Let's listen to what Rahab said here. I'm getting there. He failed. I'm fast on the last one. That's okay. Joshua 2 11. Look. Okay, read it, Brother Talk. And as soon as we had heard those, these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man. Because of you, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth. Start it again, with the Lord your God. Oh. Say it, with the Lord your God. Say it again. Uh, I'll bring the whole thing. Rahab was saying this. Now, as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man. Because of you, for the Lord your God is he. It, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. That's what she said. Mm -hmm. To the spies, for the Lord your God. Say it again. This, this doesn't work, please. For the Lord your God. For the Lord your God. He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. That's what she said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then how she back it up? What did she do to back it up? She protected them. Yep. She put it, yeah. Then she had to put a, a, ribbon. a, a, a ribbon. ribbon. A thread, a red cord. In the window. Yeah. Now she hadn't put that cord in the window. That's that works, see? Mm -hmm. She was justified by works. And she believed the Lord thy God was her Lord thy God too. Mm -hmm. But then she backed it up and he said, okay, and everybody in your house can be saved too, not just you. But everybody behind that cord will be saved. We're going to come back and wipe this place out. Mm -hmm. If you have anybody in your family, get them all in that house. But she believed to start with now. But the Lord your God, 
is my Lord too. Amen. See, that's what she said. And that's the very important part. Now, last, last thing, conclusion. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. Verse 26 says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, dead as a doornail, going to the funeral home, so faith without works is dead also. Same thing. Same thing. Any final? What What he said about the scribes and Pharisees walking around dead men. <laughs> dead men. Outside, white as sepulchers. Mm. Anything else?